If we could see the Veil Nebula with our naked eyes in the skies over our world, it would look very much as you see it in the sky on the right of the image above, about six times the diameter of the full moon, and in circumference large enough to hold 30 full moons. We call the Veil a nebula, but in reality it is a supernova remnant, and it has its circular or spherical form because it is the outward racing stuff of a star that exploded about 8,000 years ago according to NASA's latest studies. We studied the Veil in a previous video, and in that time took an image of the Eastern Veil. But the Veil Nebula is so large that even for a modest sized telescope like my 450mm ZS81 here, it would take many nights to shoot the whole thing. Tonight, we're going to return to the Veil and focus on one of the most beautiful and dramatic sides of it, a portion called the Witch's Broom. Though in truth, this is not the first time I have shot the broom. I gathered data on it last week. The Witch's Broom is considered to be one of the most beautiful and dramatic structures in the entire Veil Nebula. Like the rest of the Veil, it is essentially the shockwave or cosmic tsunami of those outward racing gases ramming at hundreds of thousands of kilometers per hour into other interstellar gases, heating them and ionizing them. All the material gets caught up like water in a wave, rolling as it goes, creating twisting, convoluted bands, giving the entire nebula its dramatic and extraordinarily colorful appearance. Now the witch's broom is up here, highlighted by an extraordinarily bright star, which adds to the glow of the broom but also creates some problems as it can tend to wash out when processing images later. Nonetheless, if we are going to photograph a specific part of the Veil Nebula, I think the Witch's Broom is a perfect choice. The good folks at NASA thought so as well and already photographed portions of it with Hubble, revealing the rolling plasma structures in intimate detail. I don't think we'll be able to do as good as Hubble, but I bet we can get close. Night is soon to fall over our dark Canadian northwood skies. Let's go ahead and get all the systems on the telescope and mount powered up, and get her aligned on the witch's broom. Now, using Nina's Sky Atlas feature, I've already entered the catalog number of the witch's broom, NGC 6960, and the Sky Atlas presented a thumbnail of the Veil Nebula along with a transit graph that let me know the ideal times to film it. And tonight is going to be a great night. It'll be pretty high in the sky. Because I live in an area where, when the sky is completely clear and the humidity is low, it is border one, I don't worry so much about shooting targets low to the horizon. Still, the higher up, the less the images will be subject to the diffraction of the atmosphere, and even a really good clear atmosphere will create some diffraction. So the higher up, the better. Guiding is not quite as good as I would want it, with an error of about, it looks to be about 1.5, maybe 1.4. And there are two reasons why that is. There's some high atmospheric turbulence, and that's causing the guide stars to bounce around a bit. But I've also just put a new and much better quality guide scope on the telescope. A 50 millimeter William Optics guide scope with 200 millimeters of focal length. And to accommodate the hardware, I created a new profile in PHD2 but I've only partially calibrated it. I got, the, I got the guiding to be adequate, though in truth, it could be made much better. It's just not necessary for this low focal length scope. And to make it much better, it would take 20 to 30 minutes. That might not sound like much, but summer nights in the Northwoods are short. It's not going to become adequately dark till about 11 p.m. and I only have till 4.15 a.m. to shoot. So I wanna make the most out of every available minute. I've run the math, the guiding is adequate, and I'm going to accept the less than perfect guiding. And some other night when I'm not so pressed for time, I'll complete the calibrations. It is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, a beautiful night outside, apart from an occasional satellite happening and the high atmospheric turbulence. Conditions are overall pretty good. The dual band filter, filters are a topic we'll have to cover in another video when we start to get into more specific technical details helps to alleviate a lot of the problems that that high atmospheric turbulence might create in the image itself. Maybe one of these days I'll have to try something like an IR pass filter on the camera for the guide scope. It might be worth losing a little light to stabilize the guide stars. Now I began gathering light data on the witch's broom several days ago when we had more clear weather. 
Unfortunately, I ran into some kind of strange bug with PHD2 after running a calibration, and PHD2 would not quite keep up with the guide stars, and also the image was not dithered. The end result was, I ended up with really bad walking noise. Now, I'm pretty good with photo and video editing, and this is the result. I was able to remove most of the walking noise and make a workable image from the data I had at that time. But I'm going to brighten the image a little bit and remove the stars and show you just how bad the walking noise was. Now, if you don't already know, walking noise is a kind of noise that shows up in each frame after a calibration, and it looks a lot like brush strokes across the image. In fact, I've sometimes seen it referred to as paintbrush noise or brush noise. It's quite different from luminance noise or color noise, which don't have any fixed pattern. And generally, walking noise is, is thought to have ruined an image. It's one of the hardest types of noise to deal with. I think I've done a pretty good job here removing it, but it's still there. If you're curious how I removed the walking noise, or mostly removed it, I used Affinity Photo. And we'll have to go into how to do that also in a future video. It wasn't easy, but it wasn't that hard either. But fortunately, there is a cure for walking noise, and the cure is more dithered data. So I would have revisited the witch's broom no matter what, because I really wanted to capture a beautiful image of it. And in fact, over the course of the summer, I'll probably revisit the witch's broom at least a couple more times, because every time I do, the final product just becomes more and more detailed. But my goal is tonight to capture about 6 to 6.5 hours more data as much as I can before there is too much light in the sky and a bit more dithered data than I usually do, and apply the sum total of all the images to a stacking, and I think that will cure our problem. Now, I usually aim to dither somewhere between 12 and 16 pixels on the imaging camera, and because dithering takes some additional time while the software makes a slight movement in the mount, I usually aim to dither only once every four frames, but tonight I'm going to dither one in three. I want a little bit of additional dithered information because I'm thinking it might help in removing the walking noise from the previously gathered data. So at this point, if you're new to astrophotography, you're probably wondering just what is dithering? Dithering is when you put small random movements into the mount, just a few pixels one way or another, so that the image appears to shift just a little bit. Now you might be wondering why on earth we would want to introduce a little bit of movement to since our goal to hold the image as steadily as possible in front of the camera. Well, yes and no. We do need to hold the image very steadily in front of the camera. The problem is, software is going to process in the morning somewhere between dozens and tens of thousands of individual images. It's going to stack them all together adding the light to create our final composite image. And the software cannot always be sure what is the desired light versus random light noise in the image. All kinds of things can create random noise, such as the pitch black of space. Well, cameras are designed to capture light. They don't know exactly what to do with the pitch black, and often they might show it as a little bit not quite black. And so in an image, all of that not quite black can turn up as luminance noise. And the camera doesn't know exactly what to do with the absence of color, too. So it might show up as a little bit of undesired color noise. Now, there are numerous noise removal algorithms that help to remove that undesired noise. And for images of stars and planets, they work quite well. But if you're trying to shoot something like the haze of a galaxy or a nebula, well, these algorithms, they don't know that that haze is not noise. And they tend to do funny and undesirable things with nebulae and galactic hazes. So you want to use noise removal software as conservatively as possible. So just how on earth do we get rid of this noise? Well, we can prevent some of it by making use of our camera's offset setting. Now, offsets is not technically a way to deal with noise. It is, rather, a way to make sure that the camera is gathering every little bit of data possible and that the tiniest fractions of data that otherwise might be overlooked by the way the camera converts digital data to analog imagery will not be lost in the conversion. I know that sounds Greek. I remember my early days in astrophotography. Let's look at it in another way. Imagine that your camera is actually comprised of millions of little buckets. Those are your pixels. The pixels fill with photons that are converted into electrons, which your camera reads as light. So many electrons give the bucket a light value of one. So many more electrons give the bucket a light value of two, and so on. But if a pixel does not receive enough photons to cross a level of brightness, that information is lost, and at the lowest level, that pixel shows up as black. Digital cameras don't do well with black, and that's a place that noise can creep in. 
So we add an artificial brightness value, the offset, to help us catch that tiniest bit of information. This slightly brightens the image, but also helps us to reduce noise. But when it comes to outright getting rid of noise, probably the single most effective tool is dithering. You see, when you move the camera just a little bit, any actual desired source of light in the image will remain consistent. The stars will sh still show up as stars. The nebulae and the galactic hazes will still have their glow, whereas the noise will waver and move about randomly. And this helps the software during stacking determine what is desired light and what should be aligned and stacked together versus undesired noise that should be ignored. In point of fact, dithering is probably the most effective noise removal tool there is, and if you're not using it, you need to start using it. I mean, I'm not going to make you use it, of course, but you will see a noticeable improvement in your images almost immediately. The standard dither is about 12 pixels on the imaging camera, though I've heard of people dithering up to 30, 40, 50, even 60 pixels, like I said, for myself, I usually dither between 12 and 16 pixels. I don't dither every frame, just every four frames, and I find that's adequate. I know some people dither only once every 10 or 12 frames. Other people might dither every other frame. In part, that is based on how long each exposure is. I'm shooting five minute images right now, so I'll dither an image once every 20 minutes. If I was shooting lucky imaging, shooting one second images, I might only dither once every 10, 20, 30, 40 images, if that. And if I was shooting 20 minute images, I would probably dither every single image. Basically, the longer you shoot, the less frequently you dither. So like I was saying, I usually dither once every four images, especially when shooting two to five minute images. But tonight, to deal with that walking noise from the previous data collection, I'm going to dither one in every three images, just, some, just to get some additional dithering data to help add to the stacking program's algorithm, help it sort out what is desired imagery versus undesired. By the way, I make no claims at being a, an expert on noise or dithering. I'm just a guy who likes astrophotography and teaches natural history for a living. So if you know something about dithering that is more accurate or that would work better, by all means, please feel free to leave a comment below. And all too early on these perfect summer nights in the north, dawn has arrived. I'll have the mini PC beam the data that it collected during the night into my primary computer, and we'll see what the additional light data in combination with the additional dithering did. This was tonight's data stacked on its own. Apart from stretching the histogram and slightly increasing the black level, I've done very little additional editing. It's good, but you can see the, the image is fairly granular as well. And this is because there just is not enough data in one night's imaging, not with these short nights where, if I'm lucky, I can collect a total of six and a half hours of data. But when we stack it in combination with the data we were able to gather almost a week ago, we get this. Dithering to the rescue and mission accomplished. Light data saved. And what I feel is a superb ground-based telescopic image of the witch's broom. The additional data helps to fill out the gas and brings out additional details in the luminosity and the contrast differences of the various gases and colors within the witch's broom part of the Veil Nebula. This is such a beautiful, beautiful nebula. I think definitely one of the most extraordinary things to, to image in the night sky. And a bit later in summer, I'm going to spend more time on it. I wonder what it'll be like after I put two or three more days, or nights that is, worth of imaging into it. Thank you for joining me on the Sky Story Channel for another adventure among the stars. And remember, wherever you point your telescope, set your offsets and your dithering.